This is Jewish Spotlight, a weekly television program presented by Chabad Lubavitch of Long Island, featuring various aspects of modern Jewish life and Jewish culture. Now, here is your host, Rabbi Tuvia Telvin. Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish Spotlight. In my travels around the New York City area, I often meet people who see the show. Very often I get the question that people would like to know a little bit more about the basics of Judaism. What is really the basic message of Judaism? And we've had a couple of shows to talk about this, but I'd like to take it one step further. I want to talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments. I meet people, and people tell me they're a moral code. They may talk about their principles. They talk about the things that really make a difference to them as far as their own personal value system. But the Ten Commandments very often are not part of that in terms of really people having a knowledge of what these Ten Commandments are. It's really a fascinating code of law as far as how God presented those specific Ten Commandments to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai over 3,300 years ago. And it's a set of laws that has maintained the test of time, which not always do values maintain that test of time. So I'd like to go through it in a way that hopefully will give you some real stimulation and some interest as to what is the makeup of these Ten Commandments and why they are what they are. Well, first of all, let's put this into a certain context as far as what exactly happened at Mount Sinai. We believe that 49 days after the Jews left Egypt and were freed from the Egyptian bondage, that they arrived at Mount Sinai, united in the cause of being able to finally be, come to be spoken to by God, who would teach them the way that he wanted mankind and human people to live, to live together, to be able to organize society, to be able to live moral lives, to have proper marriages, to have proper child rearing, and many, many different things that were given to the Jewish people. But these 10 commandments are only 10 of 613 that are given all together in the five books of Moses. But they each represent something much more than what is seen on the surface. Incidentally, it's very interesting as well that the name of the portion of the five books of Moses, of the Torah, in which these 10 commandments are given is called by the name of Yisro or Jethro. Now Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. And it says about him that he was a great priest in the sense that he knew all the different religions of the time. And he was an expert in all of the black magic, white magic, and all the different teachings and everything you could possibly imagine. And nevertheless, he said, Ato yadati kogodol Hashem mikol holakim. Now I know that the God that presented himself to the Jewish people at Mansane was a truly the truth behind the greatest of all the different types of gods that people during those pagan eras were believing in. And the question is brought up, why was the Torah given? Where we have a monotheistic oneness of God revealing himself to all of humanity at that time. Why was it done in such a way that the name Jethro, a non-Jewish father-in-law of Moses, was emphasized to such a great, great degree? And the reason that's given is the following. Because the God that revealed himself in Mount Sinai is one for every single human being. Even a person who is, so to say, an expert in all different types of spiritual disciplines and far and distant from a belief in monotheism that perhaps could be involved in some type of polytheistic or pagan rites of, of any type. And there are many still practiced throughout the world. So as a result, the message was that even this person can feel close to the giving of the Torah and the principles behind it. And this lesson is also brought out in the fact that the Torah was given in a desert. It wasn't given in a metropolitan area or in the suburbs or in a rural area. It was given specifically in a desert to show that even a place desolate of any life was a place that nevertheless could give birth to great principles and values. So let's start now to talk about these Ten Commandments. First one, Anochi Hashem Alekecha, I am the Lord your God. Now, this commandment, which is a proclamation of the oneness of the belief in God, a proclamation of God who is really a God that creates the, the whole universe, as we know in the beginning of Bereshis, the beginning of Genesis, that this God who spoke and brought the world into being is the same God that spoke to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. But it's interesting though, God did not say that he, I am the Lord your God who created the heavens and the earth. God said and said, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Now the word you in Hebrew could be the you plural or singular, as it could be in English. Here in the Hebrew, it's specifically though written in the singular tense, which means that 
this was a personal communication to every single man, woman, and child standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses himself, of course, to be able to feel that personal relationship with God, that God was talking to them, and God had taken them out of Egypt, and was personally involved in their lives, and had, they had personal benefit from that relationship. It wasn't a cosmic or a, or a universal type of relationship. It was one that was very, very targeted and custom-made for the individual person standing on my side, who had just experienced that exodus 49 days previous to the giving of the Ten Commandments on my Sinai. So as a result, we see from the very beginning God wanting us to know that these principles are principles that are for you on an individual basis. The second commandment is not to have any other gods before you. Now, not having any of the gods does not just mean the idols of those times or the pagan worship that they would have or the different types of practices which were so current during that era. But the idea of not having any of the idols is that when we have a belief in God, even a trust in God on a very personal level, that nothing else has the ability to take away from that belief or trust, whether it be cars, money, intimacy, whether it be a, a television show. These are things that all have to be put into a context where the primary feeling that we have in our relationship to life is that there is a creator behind this whole world that is our first priority to be able to give thanks to, give recognition to, and to live according to these, the practices that God presented for us. So as a result, not to place any other part of the world that God created above and beyond God, not to make it an idol which distracts us from our true purpose, which is the first commandment, the recognition of one God. In fact, as I mentioned, the one God, and it says I, says I with the Aleph Nun Chof Yud. The Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And Bereshis, which is the first letter of the Torah, is in the beginning. And the question is, here we have a base which begins the Torah, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and Aleph, the first letter, which begins the Ten Commandments, to show that even though the world is a beautiful place and it's created by God and has great significance, but nevertheless the Aleph, the letter that comes before the base, is really the more important of the two, that the Ten Commandments come before anything that might be in the creation that God created, or the, the importance of the values and, and morals come before any of the distractions that we might be creating idols out of in the world around us. The third commandment is concerning not using God's name in vain. Now, why is this such an important commandment that makes it into the Ten Commandments? Because obviously, from God's perspective, this relationship that God wants to have with us is more than just a matter of a commander and a commandee. It's a relationship of respect, a relationship where God is giving, God is flowing His abundant blessings, flowing our life, right? it's the cells in our body, the air we breathe, the whole environment that we benefit from, and making it a world for us that is of such beauty and of such benefit to us personally that we're able to live in this world and be productive in it. And as a result, this relationship is something that God takes seriously as well. And when we say something against God, it's, it's personal. We don't look at God as being this distant entity, way, way up in the heavens, far away from us, where when we say that we believe in one God, it's one God as opposed to perhaps there are three or four gods. That's not what we mean when we say that we believe in one God. We believe in one God that is a total entity, a total energy, a total God of everything, it creates everything and nevertheless is beyond everything. And as a result, we don't want to trespass that boundary which would turn that relationship into something that we're showing disrespect, that we're showing a lack of appreciation for the many gifts and blessings which God is flowing to us. Just as a parent with a child, that a child has a respect for a parent, and when the parent would turn around and turn away and the child goes someplace else, the child is talking against the parent who is trying so hard to provide for that child. The parent finds out about it, it's a very hurtful experience. Now, not that God has the same type of emotions we have or is hurt in a way of insult, the way we might think of. But nevertheless, it's up to us and incumbent upon us to make sure that that relationship is something that is guarded, that is maintained, that is hold on, held on a very high level 
in order to be able to keep its dignity and integrity intact. The fourth commandment, a very interesting commandment, is the commandment of keeping the Sabbath holy. Now, the Sabbath is the seventh day. Creation began on a day, we call it the 25th day of Elo, the last month, just before Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah we consider to be the sixth day of creation, the day that Adam and Eve were created. So in fact, Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of mankind. And the Sabbath is the completion of that creative process. Six days did God create the world. Whether we go into explaining the six millennium or six million, or, these are all side issues, not for our discussion here. Let's say six 24-hour periods, though, where tremendous, tremendous energy was flowed into this world to create and bring it into being. The beauty of the world, the, the, the miracle of life, where the incredibleness of the world came into being. And then God said, and it was by Yehulu Hashemayim Ba'aretz, he completed the creation of the heaven and the earth. Now, we rest on the Sabbath. Why? Not because it was hard work for God to create the world, and in commemoration to this hard work that God did, we also rest. Because if that would be the case, we wouldn't be able to lift up furniture, we wouldn't be able to do anything that required sweating, perhaps, or any other type of work that required a, an energetic effort. The fact is, I could spend the whole day Sabbath taking my chairs up and down in my house from the first floor to the second floor, and there would be nothing in the letter of the law of the Sabbath that would be broken at that time. However, in the spirit of the Shabbos is something much deeper. The spirit of the Shabbos is giving recognition to God having created this world. This God who we said in the first commandment took us out of the land of Egypt, who created the world and gave it a special gift, a gift of rest. In fact, after the six days of creation are completed, it says in Genesis, that God had created the whole world and everything was created except for one thing, and that was rest. Ba Shabbos, Ba Menucha. Shabbos came and the concept of rest was created as a result. And this rest gives each and every single one of us the ability to sit back and to appreciate what that creation is all about. Not only in the greater sense as far as how great and how beautiful the creation is, but what my creation is all about, what my purpose in life is, what I am here for, what am I working for, why am I going to work, why am I making the money that I'm making, why am I doing the things that I do. And it's a day of the week to reunite with God, to be able to make that relationship renewed as a cycle from week to week, as we do from day to day when we wake up in the morning and say our blessings and say our prayers, to constantly keep that cycle moving. But the Sabbath is a special day for that cycle to let our cattle rest, to let our, our farm animals rest, to be able to, to reconnect with our family, to be able to reconnect with our children, with our, our God, our community, ourselves, and really to come into touch with ourselves once a week in a way that too many people these days don't have an opportunity to do. How many families, for instance, on a Friday night might take our time, any night of the week, but for a Jewish family observing the Sabbath to take our time and to just turn off the radio, television, no telephones, no money, no cell phones, no beepers, no palm, nothing. And just connect to family. Just communicate, just open ourselves up, appreciate God's gift of life, and be able to really look at life for what it is, resting from the previous week, but at the same time preparing us for renewal to be able to come into the next week with a new vigor and new energy and new enthusiasm based on the fact that we have a greater appreciation for who we are, for the gifts that God gave us, and for the wonderful life that we each lead. Sure, it has difficulties. Sure, we all have obstacles and challenges in life. There's no question about it. But the gift of life can really be appreciated on the Sabbath when we take our time and we just go back to basics. And that's what the Sabbath rest is really all about, getting back to those basics. We don't need all the extra toys and gifts and gadgets and other things that we have and that we buy and that we use six days of the week. But we need to be in touch with ourselves. And too often, we lose that aspect of our lives. The fourth commandment reminds us to keep in touch with ourselves, keep in touch with God, and do things specifically for that purpose. The fifth commandment, also a very important commandment, the commandment of honoring our mother and our father. 
perhaps one of the more difficult commandments in some situations. And I know sometimes people have come to me with situations where it is difficult to love parents. But this is not the commandment of loving parents. The Torah says to honor. And honor we can all give in some small way. Why do we honor our parents? Because they brought us into this world. They, in fact, were God's tools and vehicles for giving us life. And they might not have been the greatest parents, or perhaps they were the greatest parents, and they deserve all of the honor that we want to give them and much more. But whatever the relationship might be, honor they deserve, because honoring parents is, in a way, honoring God himself. Yes, because when we honor our parents, we are recognizing the fact that somehow, something, somebody brought us into this world and gave us a gift of life. Ultimately, it was God, but it was our parents who were the intermediary through which God did give us this life. And how do we know that, in a certain sense, honoring our parents is like honoring God? I'll tell you why. Because the Ten Commandments are ten, but we know that they were given on two tablets. Now, why were they given on two separate tablets? Couldn't Moses have carried one large tablet instead of two tablets? Couldn't God have written all ten on the same tablet? Of course. But they were written on two different tablets for the following reason. Because the first five commandments deal with mitzvot, commandments that are between humankind and God. The second, as we'll see soon, the second set of commandments deal more with relationships between human beings themselves. And these are two very important parts of morals and principles. That we need to have that balance of knowing that we are in, in keeping our integrity in our relationship with God and simultaneously keeping our integrity in our relationship with our fellow human being. Now, it's not possible to only do one without the other. You need to carry both tablets in your life. You can't just have a life dedicated to religion and a relationship with God and doing all things that God would ask you to do or did ask us to do. And on the other hand, mistreat human beings in your relationship with them. Unacceptable. On the other hand, just being a good human being and being good with other people is not the whole picture as well. Having a relationship with God and being able to incorporate the values and have a source for those values of why we're being righteous, why we're trying to be good to another human being, these are also part of the balance. As we've seen, there have been societies that thought they were very right in the way they behaved. We saw during the Second World War how a whole country felt it was right and justified and moral in what it had done in Germany. However, when the morals are directed by the human intellect, they can be very vulnerable to rationalization and to sometimes pure evil, as we've seen. But when morals are balanced with a higher value, a higher system, a higher principle, then they stay on the right track. Getting back to the mitzvah of Kibbut of Aim, honoring our parents, though, this is the fifth of the Ten Commandments. It's still on the first tablet of the two tablets. And as a result, we see how it became part of those Ten Commandments, why it's on the first, because God looks at honoring a parent as if you're honoring God. I know some of you might have some difficulty with that. But again, this is honor. Honor means to show respect, not necessarily speak unkindly in their presence. Even to the degree sometimes, as our sages point out, not to sit in our mother or our father's seat that they might have in the house. To do th even the little things that might show honor, whatever the situation might call for. So this is, in fact, one of the beautiful parts of the fifth commandment. Going on, we talk about the sixth commandment, the beginning of the second tablets. The sixth commandment, lo tirzach. Lo tirzach means not to murder. Now, I just want to tell you and share with you a story. After Flight 800 out of Long Island, I was called upon to help out at the, the uh, Coast Guard station where they were bringing the body bags in and the parts of the bodies from the terrible crash that took place with TWA 800. And during that time, I saw a number of individuals from the Suffolk County Homicide Squad. And I saw on their shirt that it said, Thou shalt not kill. I had a discussion with him and I told him it's really a, a not a proper translation of the sixth of the Ten Commandments. Because the commandment says, thou shalt not murder. The difference being, and it's an important difference, 
Murder is a wanton act, a deliberate act of taking another life. Killing can sometimes be in self-defense. There are situations that we see in the Bible itself, in the Torah, where taking another's life is a necessity. If somebody is coming after you, for instance, to kill you, it's a commandment to kill them first, to defend yourself. That's part of the rationalization for why in Israel. Israel does preemptive drives against those people who they know are out and are planning specific types of activity against the Jewish people to destroy us, whether it be in one person or many people, God forbid. Because even taking one life is like taking a whole world. So that we have a, an incorporated respect, though, for life. This command teaches us to realize and appreciate the beauty of life. A life is not something to be taken lightly. A, li a, a life is something that is a gift from God that is to be cherished, that is holy. Life itself is considered to be the, the greatest gift that God has given. So much so that we go to any degree and we break any commandment of God in order to save a life, in order to get somebody to a place where they can be healed. If it would be on the Sabbath, when normally we wouldn't be driving in the car to the hospital, but if there's a situation where somebody requires important medical care, it becomes a commandment to get in that car and go to the hospital in order to be able to deliver the proper medical care. Because life is the ultimate statement of holiness, and taking it is the opposite. Taking it disconnects us from life, disconnects us personally from God himself as a result of taking a life. As a result, this is a primary teaching of our Torah. We also find lotinaf. What is another important mitzvah? Is having proper relationships between man and wife. Man and woman, between husband and wife in a holy and a proper way. Adultery is not an accepted mode of behavior. The idea of monotheism, believing in one God, and the idea of monogamy, of having one wife, and being dedicated and being very, very special in that relationship is something that we try as a part and parcel of our Jewish belief system to make sure that this is something that we will always, always keep at the holiest of our belief system. This is why this is included in this because the human relationships between one person and another always have to be maintained on the highest of levels, whatever we might do. In addition, we go on to the next mitzvah, which talks about not stealing, respect for another person's property, respect for another person's ability to be able to own part of this world, to be able to work hard, to have what they have worked hard for. And this is something where we respect another human being who they are, what they are, what they own, what they have diligently deserved. This comes down, though, to even the finest of details. It's not just a matter of not stealing on a large scale of going out and robbing a bank. If a person is in the airport and they're in a rush to catch a plane and they get off the phone and the phone starts to ring because they still have to deposit 25 cents and they say, nobody will know I'm off to the plane. No. We do what's right because it's right, not because nobody is going to know, because ultimately God knows in any case. So Lotignov, not to steal, not to even steal a, a, a person, not to do anything that would somehow take away from another human being, because this is a lack of respect for the beauty and the holiness of that individual. And that's a very, very important point. Even if you're in a supermarket and the, the cashier at the counter makes a mistake, whoever favor it's in, it doesn't make a difference. The important thing is to make sure that we stay above board and do what's right. We go on now to the next mitzvah, very interesting mitzvah, of not giving false witness. Why would this make it into one of the Ten Commandments, not to give false witness? Very simple, because God is creating this world and we believe in such a thing as divine providence. Divine providence means that we have a situation where every single aspect of life has a connection to God, that God is actively involved in our life. And we see that somebody did something and we lie about it. We're really recreating creation. We're redefining the creation that God made. And this relates to the 10th commandment as well of not being jealous, not coveting your neighbor's property, his wife, husband, house, belongings or possessions. 
Because when we see another person's property and we somehow feel, why shouldn't I have this? Why do they get it? What do they do to deserve it more than I did? What we're again doing is denying a certain amount of God's personal involvement in our lives and in the environment around us and the purpose for our soul, why we were put into the situation, into the body, beautiful or ugly, into the financial situation, rich or poor, into the marriage or into their children or the family, whatever it might be, denying God's personal involvement in that situation. And that connects us back to the first commandment, where we see how God in the giving of the Ten Commandments, when they give us a system of life which really relates to how to live an upright life, a life where there's personal satisfaction, personal sense of purpose, where there's a, a direction a person has, there's a way to maintain a relationship between us and God as well as us and our fellow human being. And to do it in a way where it works. And we know that this is a system that has worked for over 3,300 years, that has in fact been the, the, uh, the fountain for moral codes for many other religions as well, and has been accepted as being part of the basics of how to live a proper life. So in your own life, if there's any aspect of this that you feel that could add something to your life, or let me put it this way, I'm confident that it could add to your life. The question is we're only trying to figure out how, in fact, to incorporate in your life. It might be very difficult, and some of these things aren't difficult, but that's a definition of morals. Morals are not just things that come easier, that are comfortable. Morals are things that are difficult decisions that we have to do sometimes against our nature in order to be able to be all that we can be, to be a human being in the true sense of the word, to exercise free choice going beyond what can possibly sometimes be a very base nature and to try to improve upon it, to make it the full potential of what a human being could be in this world. So when we incorporate these Ten Commandments and especially to try to give them to our children, then we are doing something very, very special. And as we've pointed out before, many of these Ten Commandments we apply to all of humanity. Most of them are, are basics that everybody should learn from, everybody should try to incorporate into your life. So I hope that you also learn something from it and you'll be able to take something from it for your life to make it a better life as well for you, your family, and your community, and most importantly, for that inner soul and inner voice inside. Take care. We'll see you next week at the Jewish Spotlight. Same time, same station.